Hello. Hello, welcome. Welcome. Let's see the participants coming in. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining. Seeing a few familiar names already. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you are located in the world. Hi, guys. Welcome. few more hey everyone welcome okay we'll just wait a few more moments to let the rest of uh, the attendees join thanks all for joining feel free to use the chat post where you're from perhaps what if you're working with the company it'd be great to see who's here um from what part of the world as well no x late team calling from different parts of the world too but welcome hey guys thanks for joining Awesome. Got a raised hand. Hey, welcome. Hey, Deva, welcome. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining. All right, just one minute in. Some names, some place in the chat. Let's have a look. Japan, France. Well, hello. Oh, I missed all these. Welcome, definitely good morning and good afternoon and good evening as well. And Malta, India, Germany, Orlando, Austria. Lovely. Very exciting. Good morning from Argentina, from France. Hi, Vanessa. How are you doing? Richard, unfortunately, we can't hear you, but all good. From Wirral, Fraser, hey, India. Awesome. Right. I think we're probably good to make a start. Uh, I'll just check the attendees. I think we're all right. Um, Right, let's make a start. Awesome. So uh, I think we'll, well, some few more people do filter in. Let's see a few more people joining. Thank you. Welcome to this uh, webinar hosted by Exalate. Uh, today we are covering how to set up and customize an ITSM integration with Simple Code and AI Configurator. So thanks everyone for joining. Um, first of all, we're going to go through some housekeeping rules. Um, I'm sure you've all used Zoom before in the past. And we've got a few different features in here that I'll just briefly explain. So the chat function, keep chatting in there, go for it, add whatever you want, any sort of chit chat. We're going to throw some links in there as well to some resources and some stuff that we're going to cover. Um, and then we've got the Q&A section there too. So if you've got any questions about what we're saying about you know the technicalities of the product or what we're covering in the webinar, post them in there. We're going to copy them to a deck later or a slide later on um, in the presentation at a live Q&A at the bottom and go through those in more depth. Uh, also, we can answer some of those throughout the session as well, but just helps us see them and not slip away in the chat, of course, too. Um, and polls, not North and South Pole or anything like that. We're talking about questions and answers. Uh, we want to hear from you guys, hear what you're understanding, uh, and it helps us to shape what we're talking about as well. So do see them, they'll pop up on the screen in front of you as well. So you can't really miss them if you're paying attention. Um, On to the actual contents of the webinar, we're going to do a bit of an introduction into Groovy scripting. Uh, what is Exalate? And then we're going to go through a demonstration as well, using those Groovy scripting and everything, of course, and then show you a little bit into the future uh, of AI in, in the integration kind of landscape with Exalate. That'll be taken by Usman and the first bit taken by Majid. So, of course, stick around at the end as well. They nearly missed it for that live Q&A where we can cover all those questions. And I should probably crack on with some introductions at who's here in the room as well. So I work on a day-to-day -day basis with Majid uh, and we've covered all sorts of, of client cases, UK government, uh, KPMG, Atlassian, et cetera, um, and work really closely together. So really good to see you here as well, Majid. Thanks. Um, fun fact about Majid, just a little side point maybe. Um, have we got any cricket fans on the webinar? He's played cricket on the famous Lord's Cricket Ground uh, here in London as well. So I won't go too much into it. Uh, it's not, I know it's not what we're here to, to talk about today. Um, but also Usman is joining us as well. Usman's been in the business for about a year. I think exactly pretty much a year, right? So we're throwing him into a webinar today, uh, getting, getting him at the deep end. Um, and Usman's been a, a really positive uh, impact in the business, actually, and has, uh, has, has implemented AI in all different shapes and sizes. One of those shapes and sizes is to the right of him, Ada. I'll let him speak about her, I should say, and not, and not, um, and not. I won't, I won't take too much of the spotlight there. But uh, yeah, over to you guys, perhaps for a quick hello. Thank you, George. Hi, everyone. This is Majid here. Uh, I'm the head of solutions engineering here at Exley. 
uh, been here around two and a half years. Uh, and uh, yeah, set up uh, hundreds of these integrations uh, along with George, most of them along with George uh, in production environments. I see a lot of familiar faces, familiar names in uh, the attendees list. So very good to have you guys on board today. Uh, I think I should take this opportunity to introduce our host properly as well. So George is an integration consultant here at Exalate. He's been uh, here for around three years. And yeah, as he said, we work very closely together to set up these integration projects end to end. Uh, fun fact about George is that he is uh, he hails from London, supports Tottenham, and his favorite band is from Manchester. So figure that, yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, I'll pass it on to Usman. Thank you very much, Majid. Uh, so yeah, I'm Usman, uh, one year at Exlate. Uh, happy to be here. I'll be presenting uh, the AI sneak peek uh, dur during the end of the webinar, so please stay tuned. With me, I have Ada. Um, she's an advanced uh, AI sidekick, helping us with customers to explain all parts of documentation. She's a very, very nice advanced AI, helping everyone with all different problems. Uh, more on Ada later this webinar as well. So back to you, George. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Ishman. Um, perfect. So I think we could draw together uh, and understand why we're all here today, which is to talk about ITSM integration, and integration itself. At Exalate, we believe that uh, teams work best in the tools that are designed for them. And you shouldn't have to leave those tools to go get data to resolve tickets or anything like that. So we believe about collaboration between tools and making sure that teams work best in the tools that are designed for them while being able to sync data and collaborate with different tools and different teams too. So what is Exalate? Or I just kind of say, who is Exalate? Well, Exalate, as I mentioned, it's an integration software. It's a collaboration tool. It's all about connecting teams. But we've been doing this for about 12 years. You can see our listing here on the Atlassian Marketplace. We've got the little spotlight badge there at the moment, of course, which is cool. Um, I and mean, yeah, we've worked with, as we mentioned, a range of businesses, but but really we're about connecting multiple ITSM systems as well here. Um, I've maybe talk about how Exalate kind of works briefly as well. So Exalate works in, in the fashion of having a dedicated app on each side, and that app fits that platform like a glove, so you can sync data within those tools as per your requirements and how you'd want it to work. And it, it does that in a very flexible and customizable way. We believe that you know, everyone's set up their service now and their Jira in a specific way to serve their business. So why brandish it with a, a static UI? We want to allow you to customize the integration with Groovy scripting. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Pop a link in the chat as well. This is where you can find out a bit more information about Groovy. But of course, I'm going to hand it over to Majid uh, for this section on Groovy scripting. Thank you very much, George. Uh, so yeah, we'll dive a little bit deeper into how Ruby works and how we can use it in uh, Exalate. But before we jump into it, uh, let's uh, do a very quick poll of the audience to see what uh, our non Ruby skills are like, what our knowledge base is like, and I'll tailor uh, the next part according to uh, how many people get there. So I see people voting, uh, it's great. Okay, so... Yeah, I think I think the results are pretty much uh, as expected. There are very few people who consider themselves as proficient, but there are some who are also saying, what is good? Okay, I'll just give it a few more seconds. Cool, so, all right, so 64% uh, of people say that I can, Get by using Google and others say what is Ruby. Okay, that's that's fine. So we have all sorts of knowledge levels uh, within the audience today. So I'll tailor this next part according to that, not too fast, not too slow. So uh, Ruby is basically a Java syntax compatible uh, scripting language for yeah the JVM. Uh, the real power of Ruby comes uh, in the fact that it blends seamlessly into Java code. So you don't have to write full blown Java code, but you can just script your way around it to fetch all the goodness out of uh, Java. It's fully object oriented. It supports dynamic typing and a lot more of it as we go along. Uh, this will be a pretty hands-on demonstration of the concepts that I want to get across. So we'll be using this Ruby web console uh, to do uh, our practices. So just a little example of how this will be used. Uh, so if you put your code out here and you use the execute button, the window that the tab you're after is the output tab really, where the output of the script would be spewed out. 
The result tab would also be useful in some cases where a value is being return, returned by the script. And lastly, the error tab. Uh, yeah, hopefully we won't have to see a lot of that. Right, so let's get started with uh, the concepts that we want to quickly review before we get into how we use these in an integration. So variables as in like any other programming languages are placeholders, uh, are places where you keep your data and then reference that later on in your scripts. Now, the good part about Ruby is that there's a whole variety of syntax you can uh, you can declare and use variables. You can use the classic notation whereby you specify the data type and the variable name, or you can just use the keyword def to do it, or you could even not use anything. I'll show you what I mean in a second. Uh, Groovy variables are case sensitive like Java and most other languages as well. And I want to show you a little trick of string interpolation, which we use a lot actually within uh, the Xlate word world. So let's say we start off by creating a couple of variables. Uh, let's use the def keyword out here. So the first way is the classic int a, the second is using def, and the third one is just using nothing. So even all these three methods is absolutely fine in within Ruby. Now let's say that I wanted to print out the first value, which is a. So I think everybody would be familiar of this sort of syntax whereby we concatenate a variable value within uh, with the output string, and that's fine. It would work and produce the output. But much more convenient is the string interpolation approach whereby you can expand strings within the, uh, within the string literal that you're typing. So this should spew out uh, first equals 10. And yeah, you can continue going. So you can say that the capital A would be a 20 and yeah, it keeps going. So very, very useful to have the string interpolation. It saves you from that horrible syntax of concatenating again and again and again. It just gets really confusing. Right, the next thing I want to focus on is uh, again, something which is very widely used within uh, Xlay. So it's the safe navigation operator. Uh, this is essentially an enhancement on the dot operator, which is used to access the data members of a class and other structures. So to do this example, let's consider a simple class called company, which has only one data member called name, right? So that's a simple class. Now we declare, a variable, an instance of this company called Acme, and then we name it uh, as Xlate. So then when you print out acme.name, uh, this should all work as expected, and it should print out the company name. All good. So this is the dot operator. Now, what happens if the object that I'm referring to is unreferenced? It's the, that object doesn't exist. So if I hit execute, uh, some of you might have noticed uh, the output shifted to the error window itself. It threw out a null pointer exception. Yeah, I'm pretty sure most of the audience has come across it at some point. Uh, so what's the null pointer exception? So cannot get the property name on a null object, right? So the, because the Acme object is not declared and you're trying to reference something within that Acme object, yeah, the script breaks. So what the safe navigation operator does, which is a question mark followed by a dot, is that let's execute this. And this time the script didn't break, no errors. Rather, it just uh, spew out the word null. So this is the power of, uh, of, of this operator. So this is basically used to avoid null pointer exceptions. Now, why are null pointer exceptions bad? As you saw in my script, it didn't give any output. It just broke right there and then. So this is why uh, it's absolutely crucial to use uh, the safe navigation operator. Another example of where it's used very widely is that let's consider this line number two. So let's say you wanted to print out uh, the name field from street, from address, from company. These are all nested classes, nested objects probably. But what happens if any of these nested objects becomes null? It's, it's not referenced. Then this line would break and it would throw out a, a null pointer exception. So good programmers would put an if condition over there so that that doesn't happen. So if either of those objects are not null, if all of those objects are not null, then only you print it out, not otherwise. So yeah, this works, this is perfectly fine, but using it with the safe navigation, yeah, you can see how the syntax becomes really, really simple, right? So it's doing all that checking for you in the background. Now I see a lot of clients, uh, a lot of people using the safe navigation operator within Xlate scripts. Uh, and yeah, it's, it's a very good practice to use it, but you need to understand very clearly where to use it with. So why is it absolutely crucial uh, in Xlate? So think about it. You or your scripts are relying on the data sent by the other side, by the remote side. 
Now, if the remote side does not send the expected data, your scripts are going to fail. They're going to break. You're going to have a uh, block sync in there, right? So let's just consider this first line, which basically picks up the reporter email from the replica, which means the remote system. So as long as that reporter information is being sent over, everything works fine. But what happens if the reporter is not being sent over? This line of script will break. It will throw out a null pointer exception, exactly like my example did, and your sync will get blocked. And how do you avoid that? You put the safe navigation just before email. Now think about it. If the reporter happens to be null, then this next is not uh, this next attribute is not evaluated, and this returns a null, and this line will just work with a null value. It the point here being that in order to avoid the null pointer exception, you put these fail safes within within your code. I'll show you these in working uh, in examples within Xlate as well. Right. Let's quickly talk about the Elvis operator as well. Uh, I think when you think about the Elvis operator, always think of the default values, right? Now, it's a binary operator, which means that it takes two operands, and I want you to concentrate on the right side of this. So what this binary operator does is that it picks up the first value as long as that value exists. But if that value happens to be null, for whatever reason, it falls back to value two. So to say it again, if value one exists, that value will be assigned to the result variable and everything's all right. But what happens if the first value is null? Then it falls back to the default value, which would be value two. I use it a lot with the next late scripts just to ensure that there is a default value there and the script doesn't break. The idea being exactly the same as the safe navigation, but in a different sort of a way. Yeah, so this last line is a very good example of this. So in this line, I'm reading the priority from the remote side. Now, as long as the priority exists, from which, which it, it's being sent over by the other side, that's fine. Then I use it and I assign it to my priority. But if it doesn't exist, if it's null, notice the use of the safe navigation as well. But if it's null, then what happens? Then we need to fall back to a default value. So then this default uh, comes into the picture. Moving on to closures. Now, closures are also something which is very, very widely used uh, in Xlate. Uh, the reason being that uh, Excellent works a lot with the data structures, and closures are an inherent part of that. Now, what are closures? Closures are anonymous blocks of code uh, that basically can take arguments, return values, and can be assigned to uh, a variable value as well. Now, that was a lot of things in one. So this anonymous block of code is basically, within the curly braces, is basically a closure, right? Think of it as a function. So exactly like you pass values to a function, I can pass these two parameters X and Y to the closure. It can do some processing and return a value. That return value gets assigned to uh, the variable that I created. Now, how do I call it? Just simply like a function, right? Multiply two, three. And you can just run it and it would be exactly the results uh, you would be expecting. Closures are used very widely in data structures to iterate over data structures. And uh, I mean, not as much in their own, but yes, you can kind of write functions as closures as well if the use case demands it. So yeah, speaking of uh, data structures, our first data structure is the list. Uh, again, something which is very, very commonly used uh, within Exley. For just as an example, uh, the comments that you sync over from one side to the other, they come in a one-dimensional structure called a list, basically, right? So what is list? A uh, list is basically a one-dimensional data structure that just holds a list of values, right? Now, there's a lot of stuff that you can do uh, in lists. So I'll start off by just checking the size of the list by calling the size method uh, of my list, right? And that would spew out the size, which is five. Right, let's do something interesting. So let me add uh, a value one to my list. Now I want to see whether that's worked. So I'll just print out the list and that's good enough. It will print out the entire list and you see that one has been added right at the end. Similarly, you can remove uh, one, right? And then print it out again. Does anybody know what's gonna happen? No, it's not gonna remove the item one, but it's gonna remove the first item, like the, it's, it's index, right? So zero, one, two. So it's gonna remove the item with index one. So 43 is going to go away and the rest of the list is printed out. Uh, similarly, you can use 
what I use a lot as well is this. Let's see if this makes sense. So I'm going to print out something. And this is how I'll use the closure within the data structure. And I'll say that if it is greater than 10, print it out. Right. I want you to focus on this one pretty closely. What have I done? I've used the find method with a closure. And the closure specifies that I only need values which are greater than 10. So there are quite a few values which are greater than 10, but it just spewed out one, which is 12. Well, that's what find does. It gives you the first occurrence of wherever the predicate is true. Doing the find all will give you all values which, uh, which, which match this condition within the closure. And lastly, you can iterate over the entire list uh, using a closure again, right? So again, you can reference each value within that list using the keyword it, it, I should have said that before, but let's say uh, I want to spew out this time uh, value equals, and let's just say it, right? So what the what the num dot each does is that it iterates over uh, the entire list. And what the closure does is whatever you program it to do. Right now, I'm just printing out stuff within it. So I expect all these values to be printed out in the correct syntax that's given, right? I'm gonna be using this uh, within Xlate as well. I'll try to use it within the comments section to kind of manipulate this a little bit to show you better examples of this. So yeah, find and find all are very, very useful. Each is also a very useful method that again, helps you iterate over the whole thing. Uh, collect is useful, but it's slightly advanced. Uh, so what collect does is exactly the same as each but it allows you to manipulate the members within the list itself. So you can, so within a collect, you can manipulate the members and then return the new list. Quite useful to have again. Right, and the last piece I want to touch on is hash maps. Again, very, very, very useful. In fact, very crucial within, uh, within Xlate really. I'll, this will make sense to you as we go along. So what is a hash map? It's essentially a list of key value pairs, right? And it makes the, oper the lookup operation, the referencing operation, really, really simple and uh, effective. Right, again, let's take a very quick look at what this is. So I've got a map called hair color with the key being the name of the person and the value being the hair color, right? Now, how do I re reference it? So let's say if I wanted to see what Peter's hair color was, so I'll reference the map using Peter as the key. So this is the key that picks out the corresponding value from within uh, within the map. And as you would expect, it would be out uh, the correct value out there, right? Uh, some of you people must have used this already, but again, I'm going to use this uh, extensively in the examples that I'm going to do. And uh, exactly like list, you can use the find, find all functions, and uh, they would work as expected as according to how the lists uh, work. Right, so that was a very quick overview of some of the concepts which we use on a daily basis uh, within Xlate scripting and just generally as well. So variables, uh, pretty pretty uh, flexible syntax within Groovy, really, really nice. Safe navigation, uh, whenever you think of this, think of null pointer exceptions or rather avoiding them. Elvis operator, again, super useful to have default values, avoid errors. Closures, again, are used mainly with these next two things, with data structures, with lists and uh, maps. In the next part of the webinar, we'll be actually using these concepts to build a real life use case uh, between a JIRA and a ServiceNow instance, uh, while, and we'll be employing Xlate to do that. But before we do that, uh, let's have a little bit of an introduction of what Xlate is and how it functions uh, over to you, George. Thanks. Brilliant. Yeah. Thanks, Majid. So yeah, uh, amazing uh, introductions into Groovy there. Thank you. I, I think that really sets the scene of why Groovy is so uh, so perfect for the integration uh, scenario in that sense uh, with those hash maps and everything. So thanks for that. Um, so yeah, putting this into the picture of Exalate and how it functions. Exalate can synchronize all those tickets issues, uh, these ticket entities across all these different tools that you can see on the screen here, cloud and on-premise. So as I was saying earlier, Exalate lives on each side. You can replicate and sync those tickets across as per your workflow and how you use those systems, those ITSM systems as well. And of course, cloud and on-premise, we've done some really interesting uh, use cases in the past of you know, two uh, JIRA data centers on-premise behind firewalls. You know, there isn't any limitations there when it comes to Exalate. 
but of course it doesn't stop with just those logos as well uh, and some some of our clients using x to sync with multiple uh, of their clients and many of their clients so it's often that you know people don't always use these uh, these uh, itsm platforms as well we can open up x and have it syncing with asana top desk fresh desk whatever itsm systems you use and um, so that's really interesting and that's our integration as a service and we we kind of manage that for you as well perhaps if anyone's got any questions on that they can always email me or pop it in the chat and we can shed some more light there um this is a really nice uh, visual uh, going through this kind of seamless integration between the tools but really x what problem it solves is allows those teams to work in their own systems that they work best in and then share that data across. When you think about customer tickets, development bugs, you don't want all of that data. So it's all about having that control. And a really a really key way that the control is achieved is through our architecture. You see this technical diagram on the right side of the screen here. You've got your, your, your two systems and your x apps that are dedicated to each one. And this means that they're loosely coupled so they're not kind of stuck together with something in the middle. Um, and that gives you that that element of control so you know what information you're synchronizing so there's no risk of synchronizing confidential information or you're not just opening up your systems you're doing it in a controlled manner and groovy allows that as well with the configuration it almost acts as a filter for you as well so yeah no risk of admin access is on the other side you know messing up your system of course these are separate entities um and, and separate platforms that have their own rules and and, and such forth so we allow that that system to live and coexist while integrating. Um, and of course, there's no single point of failure in the middle. So any sort of downtime on, on one side would not affect on the other side as well. So yeah, that's just really high level about the architecture and how it kind of looks and a bit of context there. But of course, we'll pop this in the chat as well. This is a full security and architecture diag um, white paper, as it says on the screen there. Uh, and you can go through that and, and find out some more information as well. Um, so yeah, why Excelate? I mean, x is being used on some of the Atlassian's biggest sites, uh, biggest user tiers, uh, all the way through to kind of smaller startup tech companies using Jira Cloud and, and stuff like that as well. So it's used on a whole range of, of systems and different use cases. And we were saying earlier, you know, everyone's got these set up in different ways. Everyone's got their, their ITSM serving the business in their own way, in their specific way, and leveraging that groovy scripting, of course, with different use cases um, is the best way we feel to, to achieve that. Um, got some more use cases on our website, a real range of businesses um, benefiting from Exalate and our, our software as well. So yeah, I hope that's a, a good high level coverage, Majid, Usman on the, on Exalate there and what we do a bit. Um, I'll hand it back to you guys for the uh, demos. Thank you so much, George. Uh, right, so uh, as George explained, Exalate is a decentralized app and it would need to have the app installed on both sides of the connection. So uh, rather than me talking through it, what I thought was we'll quickly set up a connection and add some automation uh, using a trigger to that. Now, the use case, uh, if it helps you think about it, is that let's let's think about it. Uh, let's think about a service now to a Jira thing. So service now is your front-facing, customer-facing service desk where the end users log tickets, basically. And let's consider a scenario where a subset of those tickets needs to be handed over to, uh, to development uh, to work on it. Now that development team works in a Jira instance in a Jira software project uh, configuration. And then they need to have that to and fro communication going uh, in order to do that. So that's what we're looking to set up. So to get started with, uh, let's open Xlate on both sides uh, to get started. So on the ServiceNow side, we'll click on console and this would take us to, uh, so basically the Xlate, Xlate's admin center for ServiceNow, right? The Xlate admin console. We're spending quite a bit of time on this. On the Jira side, I'm using a cloud instance, but yeah, as George said, it does not matter at all which Jira flavor we're using. Xlate supports each and everything. So we'll click on apps and we'll go into the Xlate admin center out here within Jira. Right, so we've got the app on both sides. The next logical step is to create a connection. Now for that, I'll just copy the base URL of Jira, come back into service now and initiate the connection. Right, so all I need for that is the, just the base URL of my Jira instance. Uh, I'll go with the script connection because that's why we're here today. I'll name my two systems. Uh, I'll call them just Snow and Jira, and I'll call the the connection as Webinar. Right. So ServiceNow has initiated a handshake towards Jira. It generates an invitation code which you can copy and pass on to the administrator on the Jira side. The assumption here being that yeah, you don't have any access to the Jira side. Let's just say. So the Jira admin comes into his instance totally asynchronously 
and accepts the invitation by plugging the code. The Jira admin will be asked uh, for one additional setting, which is absolutely crucial, which is to nominate uh, an incoming project, right? So whatever tickets are sent over from ServiceNow need to be created within some placeholder, within some project within uh, within Jira, right? So that's we are, we're nominating that project out here. Uh, beware that on the UI, you're supposed to, you, you have to select one project only, but if your use case demands that it has to be a variety of projects, that's possible via uh, the Groovy scripting as well. Right, so let's confirm that. And just confirming that means that our handshake, just a one-time thing, establishing the connection is done, it's active. And on the ServiceNow side as well, we should see the connection as active. Super. So before we do any configuration, we'll just get started and show you how uh, the base product would look like. So opening the connection, you get greeted with those scripts that we've been talking about, more of that in a minute, but I want to add some automation uh, using a trigger so that I don't have to manually uh, sync issues. So the automation that I'm gonna add is on a field called you sync this. I'll show you this in a second. But basically what I've just told Xlate is to pick up any tickets which have this matching filter and send them over to uh, the Jira side automatically. Right, so let's get started with uh, by mimicking a scenario where your service desk has a ticket created by an end user and one of your support agents uh, decides that, yeah, no, this needs further work and it needs to be sent uh, to the developer, to the other side. So let's just put some gibberish there. So this was the field that I was talking about, sync this. Uh, this is just a check field, checkbox, you sync this. And marking it, selecting it means that I've activated the Xlate trigger, right? I've asked Xlate to automatically pick this up and uh, send it across to uh, the other side. Right. So. Switching over to Jira now. On the Jira side, remember that the target project that I used was the CM project. So we'll get into the issues. And sure enough, we see that the ticket has been created. Webinar ticket one has been created. Uh, you have this nice little Xlate panel on the Jira UI, which gives you a backlink to the incident from where things started. Uh, right, so what does Xlate do from here? So the, the twin ticket that George was referring to earlier has been created. And now it's Xlate's job to create, to keep these two in sync, right? Remember, I've done no configuration so far. So I just kind of want to show you what works out of the box and then we'll enhance that using the Groovy scripts, right? So let's say we add a comment uh, to our ticket and let's say we add a proper description. Right, so now I've made two changes uh, to my Jira ticket. Now, hopefully Xlate picks these up and takes them across to uh, my incident already. So yeah, as I get to my incident, I can see that the comment has already arrived and the description has uh, already arrived. And this sort of handshake is bi-directional. Now, what that means is that if I add uh, an internal note in, in ServiceNow, because if somebody's used service now, they would be aware there's two different levels of uh, commenting. There's a public comment and an internal comment. So if I add a public and an internal comment, by default, what happens is that both of these get picked up and sent over to the Jira side. Probably not ideal. You would probably want to customize that. So let's start with uh, doing just that. So yeah, as I was saying that the internal note and the public comment with my horrible spellings uh, will make it across. This is how it works out of the box. So let's let's customize this a little bit. So let's go into service now, into our rules, right? So we have your outgoing sync and your incoming sync. I'll explain this in detail in a minute, but this would be the line which is responsible for picking up the comments from service now and transporting them over to the Jira side. Now, essentially, this is a list. This is the list data structure that I was talking about. So you can use the find all method that we were referring to earlier and we will say that do not think over the internal ones, right? So the exclamation is the not and any internal stuff will not be synced over now to the other side, right? So let's publish this now and let's do a quick test. So this time again, let's say new internal. Let's keep this internal. So this one I don't expect to sync over and new public I expect to sync over. Let's see how this uh, goes.
Right, so my new public comment did not sync over as expected. We'll refresh it and we'll take a look. Okay, so uh, we probably uh, messed up something in the in the internal. So let me just take a quick look at it. Okay, looks okay. And let's refresh to see uh, where we get to. Okay, I'm gonna send over another one to see just what's happening. Or we'll do it in the next example. That's fine as well. We'll, we'll, we'll tackle this one in the next example rather than wasting time to see what's happened here. Ah, it was just a matter of time. Apologies for that. The new uh, public comment is synced over as expected. Right, so what did we do so far? Rather quickly, but what did we do? We set up a handshake, just a one-time handshake. That's the connection established. It's a bi-directional connection. We added automation based on the field, that checkbox that you saw. And what you would have noticed is that the summary description, comments and attachments are already synced, right? Now, why is that? That is because as soon as you created the connection, all these scripts were already there. They were there out of the box, right? And they catered to all the uh, basic fields that are included within, uh, within the same. Right, so the next part, uh, we'll be concentrating on customizing and enhancing the script to add value and create a real business use case like where you'll be able to use this integration. A few very quick words of advice about uh, what these are really best practices that I personally use all the time is uh, setting up the environment. Now, this might sound trivial, but I cannot work without it, right? So how I work is that I usually have my connections or the scripts open in the first tab. I always, always, always have the errors open in the second tab and usually always also have the sync queue open in the third tab. Sync queue, if somebody's not used it, is a very good visual uh, representation of where you stand really. Like it gives you context, like uh, where the transaction is stuck, what's happening up there. And similarly, let's do the same on the Jira end really quickly. So we'll open the scripts in the first tab. Now, just a very quick word of why I do this really and why I like this so much. Somebody might have a different uh, way of doing it, but how, why I like it so much. So somebody who's worked with Xlade realizes what happens. You make a change to the script, then you run it. If there is some error, you go to the errors tab, you review the error, and then you need to come back to the script to like edit it. You, setting it up in this way means that you're just literally switching tabs all the time. It's just much more efficient. Uh, if you have an error, you read it, you come back into the script, you edit it, one button, and boom, there you are. So I think it's a very like handy tip to have. Uh, this really talks about the second point, which is written here. Uh, I think the most crucial thing in being good at integrations is to maintain context. You need to understand that there's so many moving parts to this piece that you need to understand where the transaction is, which part you're trying to troubleshoot and fix. And the first step is really awesome, like leave nothing to chance means that think about outliers, think about values which you are not expecting, but the other side still might throw at you and it might break your integration. The, the next part is perhaps the most important thing to understand uh, if you want to understand how, if you want to make your life easy in terms of configuration, this is perhaps the most important item to understand. Replica is at the heart of what Xlate does, right? So you have two systems, uh, A and B. In our case, this is ServiceNow, this is Jira. Each side has an outgoing and an incoming script. Now, what does the outgoing script essentially do? Well, let's take a quick look. What the outgoing script does is it, it picks up a lot of different data points from your from your from your entity, which in this case is an incident. So I pick up all this data from your incident and we package it into a data structure called the replica. This replica then gets thrown to the other side, to the other system in fact. And the other system, obviously the incoming sync comes into the picture and all that you need to do out there is start referencing stuff from within the replica, essentially picking out stuff from the replica and just assigning it to your own local ticket object. Uh, a lot more on that as we go along. Uh, I will try to include a debugging example as well uh, within the scripts because I think it's very useful to have up your sleeve while you're working with uh, Xlate. Uh, some other good practices and how we recommend doing uh, starting off basically this project is that we recommend starting with a one directional sync. So don't go all in at once. Start from ServiceNow to Jira. Start with some standard fields like a subset of fields and just try to do, play around with those to start with. Another thing which is absolutely crucial is to have a mapping of originating and generate or, and destination fields. Like what field in origin maps to what field on the destination side. It just helps you creating a script uh, later on. 
and be very aware that both systems are two totally independent beasts and speak totally their own languages. Jira uses the word issue to refer to tickets. ServiceNow uses the word incident, not just incident, it has hundreds of incidents. Status is called status in Jira, but it's called state in ServiceNow and so on, right? There are nuances to each system that uh, you should be aware of while doing this. Right, so let's get on to some hands-on exercises and uh, see how we get along with them. So we've already got a basic synchronization going from ServiceNow side to the Jira side, and this is these two are talking bi-directionally already, like comments, et cetera, are uh, syncing over. Now, what I want to do is some value addition to it. I'll start off with a very basic example. So we've, have, we've got two custom fields called snow ticket and snow link within Jira. And I want to populate those with, well, you would have guessed the snow ticket number and the snow link, the service now link. So I want to programmatically uh, populate these. Now, have a think about it. Where would I start this from? So where's your context? Yes, ideally I should start this off in the outgoing window of service now because that would be the party sending over the data. But in this case, it's uh, let's make it slightly different. I'm just gonna open it here because it's... Okay, so let's make it slightly different. I'll show you what I mean. So if you come into the entity sync status and just visually inspect the replica object, this replica object that we're speaking about, let's see what data we already have. So this is the payload that's already arriving from the ServiceNow site. Now, what are we interested in? We're in interested in the incident number, uh, which is out here. So the incident number is already present within the replica and we can directly reference it. It's called key. And the URL is right at the end and it's uh, referenced in a variable called issue URL. Cut a long story short, on the Jira side, you are already receiving both pieces of information within the replica, right? So all you need to do is basically just uh, script out the incoming part to populate your uh, custom fields. So the one we want to do is snow ticket and we'll put replica.key in there. That didn't go well. Bear with me. Team. And the other field uh, we want to do is snow link. And we'll put issue URL, it was called. So again, very quickly refreshing your memory, issue URL was the URL and the key was the incident number. So I put I picked those up and populated those into the relevant custom fields. Right, let's publish this and see how this goes. I published my script and now in order to trigger it, I just need to make a change on the service now side. Think about it why I'm making this change. Because what I've edited is the incoming part in Jira. Now, in order to trigger that part, I need an incoming transaction coming into Jira, right? So that's why I updated the service now ticket. And yeah, sure enough, my snow ticket number has arrived and my direct link has uh, also arrived. So fairly standard uh, uh, use case. I've included the scripts here. We'll share the slides with you later on and you'll have all the solutions in there. Right, let's do a similar sort of a use case, but the other way around, which means that I want this time the Jira ticket number, this CM11 thing, this to be populated within the correlation ID field in ServiceNow. Let me first show you what I mean. So this is the field where I want to populate the Jira ticket number. And yeah, just like we can also populate the URL in the correlation display. So again, as I showed you the replica already, it already contains all the information. I mean, I know I showed it to you on the Jira side, but uh, trust me, it would also include it on, on this side. Right, so let's populate uh, the field called correlation ID. Let's vary up my spellings and let's also populate the issue URL that is arriving as well. That would not have worked, obviously. So correlation ID question. All right, so two lines of incoming script. Again, uh, maintain context. You've added it in the incoming sync on the ServiceNow side. Now, in order to trigger it, obviously you'll need to make an update to uh, the Jira ticket so that that transaction is sent over to ServiceNow. The incoming sync triggers and the, 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 like the latest script runs, and it provides you with the correlation ID and correlation display values out there. Pretty simple, I think. Right, so 
yeah, so I've included the scripts in there. Uh, I'll give you a few seconds to think about this a little bit carefully. Now, what happens, right, you saw this working right now, but what I want you to think about is this. A ticket comes into service now, you exhalate it, like you, you manage the trigger and it takes, it picks it up, it takes it to the JIRA side. Would it still populate these fields? The correlation, ID, because ideally you want visually to have the ticket number in JIRA referenced out here as a visual confirmation for the ServiceNow agent as well, let's say. Would it work? Well, it won't, right? Because the direction is ServiceNow to JIRA. JIRA is not sending anything back, right? So the incoming on the ServiceNow side will never ever trigger. Now, in order to answer these uh, cases, uh, they're usually answered within the first sync block. So again, I'm on the JIRA side now. And what I want to do is that once the JIRA ticket is created, I want to send a transaction back to, uh, to the ServiceNow side so that the, their incoming script runs and you get the ticket number there as well. So there's a method called sync back after processing. And I've added it as the last line within uh, my first sync block. Now, what happens now? ServiceNow sends a ticket to JIRA. Ticket gets created in JIRA, but JIRA syncs back to the ServiceNow site, thereby taking the ticket number and link along with it. And that means that you will get that those fields populated within ServiceNow. Enough of me talking, let's take a look. So uh, we'll create a brand new incident. Let's start with the second one. And let's say this would be webinar ticket two. And we'll update our trigger. Right. This would be interesting to see on the sync queue, actually. So you'll see an outgoing transaction, which is fine. ServiceNow is sending stuff to JIRA. At this point, the JIRA ticket is created. And now I expect an incoming transaction, exactly. So now the JIRA has synced back. It's sending an incoming transaction. And this is the thing that will ensure that your ticket numbers get populated automatically within the ServiceNow thing. Very useful to have. Like the, your ServiceNow agent would have a visual confirmation that, okay, the ticket is created. I can just copy this link and go to that ticket directly. So webinar ticket two would have been created. Right, moving along. Uh, so the next thing is again, something which is uh, very widely used. It is a status synchronization between ServiceNow and Jira. Uh, now I've done it one way, but yeah, you can uh, obviously extend the concept to do it both ways as well. So we've got a one to many sort of a use, sorry, a many to one sort of a use case where all these statuses are mapping to the done status on the JIRA side. You can already kind of see a hash map in here, right? So these are all, this is all like a large hash map. So I've got that created already. Let me just copy it out to save time. Right, so what we want to do is, uh, we want to control the JIRA status based on the service now status, right? So we'll have a mapping of the first value would always be the service now status. And the second value would always be the JIRA status. And that's it. Once you have your map, uh, you can just use, uh, you can just reference that map, right? Exactly the same way as we did in the Ruby exercise. So we'll say replica.state. And that's it. I use the replica state. I reference my map. I pick up the corresponding value and I set the status on, on my, as long as it's correct, cool. So now what happens if I change the service now status to in progress, that's actually not a great example because it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Jira also has it in progress. So that's why it's not an ideal example. I'll show you another one. So let's say we map this resolve. Now my Jira instance definitely does not have a resolved state. Sorry, my Jira workflow definitely does not have anything called resolve. So this would map to the done status on uh, the Jira side. Should be pretty quick as well. Right, so these hash maps have a lot of value within Exalate because you're trying to map source values to destination values and the data sets, uh, well, most likely would be different. Exactly the same example, but even more customized, right? Let me explain you this on the screen actually. So ServiceNow has this field called category, right? So it's just a category field, software, hardware, network, whatever. I want to be able to use this field to control the priority of the ticket created in JIRA, right? So if it's like a network issue, it's a very high priority one. If it's a hardware issue, it's a slightly less priority one or something like that, right? So what I've come up with is this sort of a mapping. 
And again, I have this prepared already to save time. So let me just plug that in. Okay, so where would we put this mapping? Service now, Jira. So what are you trying to control here? You're trying to control the Jira side, right? That's the income. So always think about these things. So I'll put the mapping in there, nothing special, it's just a hash map again. And now we set the priority of our issue. So for priority, I need to call the node helper function get priority. And again, what we need to do is we need to reference the priority map using what? Using replica dot category. So I pick up the category from the replica, I reference my priority map, and accordingly, I set the priority. There's one very basic mistake I've made here so far. So that is that I never actually showed you uh, the part where I'm dealing with this replica category. I never sent it out. So on the service now side, I need on the on the outgoing side, I will need to add this field to my config. So I pick up the category value from service now, I put it into the replica and now uh, expect that uh, sync to work. I think network was the one I kept as the highest. So we'll use this. So so yeah, so the network is the highest, right? So my Jira priority I expect to change to highest and uh, so on, right? You change any other values and it would uh, correspond again. So uh, this is actually a very good example because these are totally two different beasts that you're dealing with. Uh, but yeah, I've included the scripts within the answers as well. The last example I want to do is uh, the other way around. So this time I want to go from the Jira side to the ServiceNow side. Let me again show you this on the screen, it's easier. So. Jira has this drop-down field called mood. It's a single select, but could be anything. And this is the mood field. Now I want to take this value and put it into the Jira mood field out here. Now this field is called view underscore Jira underscore mood, but basically a drop-down list from Jira into a text field into service now. That's essentially what I'm doing. Right, so let's get started. So this time on the Jira side, I need to deal with the outgoing script because Jira this time is the outgoing part and I'll send over the mood field. Right, so I've sent out the mood field from the Jira side and we'll publish it. I wanted to show you a little bit of debugging in this one, but I'm wary of time. So I'm gonna skip that part and we'll just populate it out here in So the field was called u underscore Jira underscore mood, and uh, we'll show you. Let's show you a little bit, at least, of what's going on. Right. So I put out, I picked up the value of the mood field, and I put it into uh, this field. Right. So let's publish it, and now let's make the mood angry. Now this would send a transaction towards service now. Yeah, there's the incoming transaction in service now, and the transaction failed. So I won't need to do anything else. I'll go into my error screen. I'll take a look at the error. And uh, okay, let's expand this. So there are a few very good things here, a few very good hints here. You already see that error line 15 is uh, the problem and uh, something's happened here. So let's go to the error line 15 and take a look at uh, what we've done wrong and we've missed out this dot operator out here, right? Okay, right, publish it. And because that transaction was already in transit, it will automatically retry it, right? So the error is gone, it automatically retried it. You can verify from the sync queue. Yes, it's gone, great. And now I expect my Jira mode to be populated, but it isn't, right? So this is, so everything worked, the transaction came, we debugged it, it was working, everything was fine, but it didn't work. Now, why didn't it work? So without telling you too much details, let's add a debug statement to our code to see what we're trying to do here, what we are dealing with. So the debug.error will... So this is basically what I'm trying to populate, right? 
this, this, this is exactly what it says in the next line. This is what I'm trying to populate. So let's print it out. Let's see what it prints out. Okay, again, let's send over a transaction. So again, this small update will mean that a sync transaction would be flowing into service now. Great, it's flowing. And I definitely expect an error this time because that's what the debug.error does. It stops the execution right at that line and it prints out what you needed to see. So this is the value. Yeah, but I expected the word angry in there. Well, the angry word is in there, but it needs, it's a value of a value. It becomes more visually clear if you look at the remote replica. So look at this structure, right? So the mood field has a value attribute, which has a further value attribute. So basically you worked it out. Like you can print it as well, just to be sure, but you have definitely worked it out that if you add another dot value layer of referencing here, this should now be enough to populate uh, the Jira mode value. I went slightly quicker on that part, but I hope it added up. And the scripts are included for your reference. So as you see, we've got like a pretty decent use case already going in 15, 20 minutes, right? Uh, Formats are syncing, attachments are syncing, we've got priority working, status is synchronizing. So it's pretty good use case and you can continue to enhance it. There's really no limits to Groovy scripting. Whatever you can think of, whatever you can script, uh, the world's your oyster, you can do it. Right, so where are we going with this? Where's Xlate going with the scripting and with the integration? Well, we've, uh, we've put a lot of effort into the AI aspect of it as everybody else is doing. And uh, if you guys, if there are any customers on the call who have noticed something, you would have seen that on your connections, when you go to edit the button, edit the connection, you already have this edit with AI option available. This would be available on your site as well. And once you click it, you say start testing, it takes you to an interface, which is uh, the configuration generator. And it's password protected right now because it's just open for very few people, but this is basically the direction we're going into. Uh, I'll let my colleague Usman elaborate more on this and kind of show you a use case of this working in action. Thank you very much, Majid, for the introduction. Um, so yeah. So right now you're able to see my screen. Um, so behind that button that Majid showed you is this configurator. So this right here is our Excelate script generator, AI script generator. It's able to take human language, human prompts. It's able to translate those prompts into real working scripts that in Groovy that will work in Excelate. So I'll start with an example. So right now I pasted in a prompt. I'll make the chat box a little bigger. So as you can see, there's also a chat box that we're in right now. So I'll expand this box. So let me explain you what I've uh, filled in this input right here. So um, I want to sync these values, key summary and description. So keep in mind, it's just plain human language. I also have a drop down in service now called category. This isn't a custom field, by the way. So within the brackets, this field should be mapped to priority in Jira. So can you map these values like this? Service now we have inquiry help, software, hardware, network, database, security. On the Jira side, you have lowest, low, low, medium, high, highest. Apart from that, we also have two custom fields. Uh, one of them is just called company name, which is just a very normal custom field that should be synced normally. And another field called customer mood. Customer mood uh, should be synced a little differently because what I want to see on the other side is customer mood is colon, customer mood, so as a variable, as Majid also explained you the, the concept of variables in Groovy. So let me start by pressing submit, and now we can wait for the magic to happen. Uh, Usman, can I just ask you why you put all that into a single prompt rather than like uh, do it separately, if that makes sense? Yeah, so uh, it's based on choice at, at the first point. Uh, in my case, I put it all in, in one time, a whole uh, big human prompt. Uh, what AI will do in the backend, it will deduce uh, requirements based on my conversation with the AI. So on the left side, we can see deduced requirements when the AI is ready, 
you will see a bunch of requirements that it's made out like probably like a bunch of, oh yeah. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six requirements that I did use from my prompt. So we can see map service now key to Jira key, summary to summary and so on. So it mapped everything to these requirements. So the result is here. Let's take a look to um, the script. So as you can see, it got my first requirement, just seeing key summary and description as normally. It also created a mapping for me. So just like Majid's exercise as well, we can see that inquiry, lowest, software, low, it's all mapped correctly. And these values get mapped as well. And take a small look. We also have the Elvis operator as well. It used that. Always cool to see. One of my final requirements was the custom field should be synced as normally. The custom name, custom field, uh, the company name custom field should be synced normally. And at the end, we had the customer mood, which should be mapped as a sentence. So in this case, we have customer mood is colon replica dot customer uh, dot custom fields dot customer mood dot value. So you can see it did some string formatting at the end here. So this is the magic of AI right here from plain human language to Xlate scripts. Yeah, this is this is just uh, just amazing. Like I'm lost for words. So whatever I did in the past, like five exercises to build that entire use case up, you just used one prompt and did that. Awesome. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, you took like maybe 15 minutes to, to, to type all out and then to check and debug. And with me, it just took maybe two, two, three minutes total. Yeah, but I'm, I'm I'm able to pick out a hole in it though. It's a very small hole, Usman, but there is a hole there. Do do you pick it? Do you see it? Uh, I don't really uh, see it at first glance. No. So so it's it's a very small like problem. At the very last line, I explained the concept of double dereferencing. Like you had to use the dot value dot value uh, uh -huh. to get the actual value out. So the AI seems to have just used a single one. But it's a very small thing. But I thought right. I'd point this out. I thought I'd point this out before this takes my job away. Uh -huh. Yeah, so as you can see, we are still in alpha mode uh, on this AI script generator. So it's still not at 100% like any other AI like ChatGPT or, or BART or the other fancy AIs out there. We still make mistakes on that side. Mm. So it's but always it's always improving. Cool. And uh, would you mind just explaining a little bit about how you got to this point? Like what was the, what, what the journey was like? Yeah, sure. Um, we... Uh, the journey is really crazy. Uh, it has been really amazing. So this large language model that uh, we're developing here is uh, based on ChatGPT4. So we have one of the strongest ChatGPT models out there right now, uh, working together with our own training data. So we have a bunch of scripts. We have a lot of code snippets that we trained the LLM with, and we created this whole working LLM that just creates this magic right here that you can see. Um, every month, day by day, we see this model improving and getting better, getting more accurate, trying to get that 100% accuracy as a result. One day, um, the customers will see it themselves. And also keep in mind, this is the first time ever we display the AI to public eyes as well. Cool, that, that uh, is awesome. Thank you so much for this, uh, Usman. I'm already very excited and slightly bit scared of uh, what <laughs> the future holds. Very, very exciting. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll open a small poll for the audience to just pick uh, what sort of integration method you preferred here, the 15, 20 minutes with me or the five, six minutes for uh, with Usman. So with that, thank you so much and back to George. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. I'll share my screen again. And thanks to everyone who's been asking some questions uh, in the chat and in the Q&A. Um, I'll just jump on the screen share again. Um, so we've added those questions uh, and let's go through them. Uh, and thanks everyone for, for sticking around as well. I see the polls in as well. Uh, okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, quite interesting. interesting. Nice. Magic <laughs> looks like you're safe for now, at least. You still got... <laughs> yeah, still or... Or, or you know what happened here? Like maybe like I know half the audience. Like, yeah, I think <laughs> a bit of a bit of bias or favoritism happening there. That's okay. Nice, awesome. Okay, so yeah, thank you all very much for these questions as well. It's uh, it's great. We'll go into yeah. these in some more depth. Uh, and Majid, you'll be able to see them too. I think actually for this first one, it might be a good idea if we use our AI 
documentation uh, Ada, our, our, our assistant. I will, I will, no, oh, I will try and stop sharing when, or, or exit the, there we go. Oh, wouldn't no. think I'd do it all day. Okay, so let's grab the self-esteem custom field from service now. I know we've had a few questions around the service now and use case as well, so that's great. Um, I think we've already put in the chat that we're doing a service now focus webinar on the 30th of April, I believe. I think it is 30th of April, I'm not. 100% sure. But um, yeah, that's obviously quite a popular integration with us too. Um, so I've just plugged this into, into Ada, um, our friendly AI bot. She's having a thing. This is a great way to, to kind of basically interact and speak with our documentation um, and be able to, to, to search the depths of it and, and save you guys a bit of time uh, and give a great experience as well. So awesome. Okay, as expected, um, Ada's begin to, began to kind of elaborate and explain and then given some some snippets as well that you can just add in there too so awesome uh, that's that's really nice um on to the next question i'll reshare a little bit as well uh so i hope that's whoever posted that is sticking around perhaps one for magic here uh, is safe navigation available in jira groovy or just in Excelate code yeah, it's it's a groovy construct. So it should like as I as I speak as I showed you the example initially, it was nothing to yeah. do with Excelate, right? It was just within a groovy console. So it's a groovy construct. Awesome. Nice. Thank you. Um and next question. Is it possible to use imports in Excelate Groovy scripting? Many groovy examples on the internet use imports. Did we cover imports? Uh not really, because we didn't really need to in any of the use cases. The simple answer here is yes. And yeah. uh but I'm I'm slightly perplexed by the next statement though. Uh, yes, Ruby scripts use import. Sorry, Excelate uses a lot of imports, but mm. not really in that case. So, like most of the stuff is built into the Excelate uh, platform anyway. But if mm. you're referencing something which is not included in there, yes, you can import uh, an external script out there. Okay, cool. So that'd be the context behind that. Awesome. Nice. I see Francis has popped something in the chat as well. Um. Awesome. So yeah, we've got a use case of DevOps where incidents come in service now and the dev work come into ADO. However, we need some incidents which need to be visible and tracked into Azure DevOps. Well, imagine is this a bit more of our bread and butter, I guess, perhaps uh, yeah. this type of use case. Yeah, I, I was going to say pop your email details into the chat because yeah, yeah, this is exactly bread and butter for it. So yeah, we, we can certainly do that. For sure. I think I've made a note of the name as well. Uh, awesome. So yeah, no, it reminds us of the, the UK Gov uh, use case we implemented as well, which is great. Okay, so a lot of times you get an error, which is not displayed, but if you check the sync, you can see there are a lot of events and stuff. Uh, uh, let me check the Jira issue. It said, waiting for a remote. Okay, so more of a user, user question here. Um, how to handle such situation? Uh, because the only way is to annex late stuck cases and start from a clean queue. So imagine perhaps uh, a little bit here, how, how do people go around? I know we ran out of time for debugging um, as well in the earlier thing, but maybe we could pop some documentation or some links so that would help understanding this whole sync queue question. Yeah, there's there's so many layers to this though. I don't know how, mm. which layer to start on uh, unpeeling at this point. Sync, uh, a stuck queue, let's just call it a stuck queue, is one of the mm. worst things that can happen within a synchronization situation. Because what happens is that your transactions start getting piled up. And then when the floodgates open, you get a massive amount of updates dumped on the destination system. So you've got to be really careful about, I mean, the way to attack this would be to root cause it, right? Like what is creating this problem? Mm. Uh, if there's no error, there's a network thing which is uh, blocking it. There's something within the script which is blocking it. I would recommend starting with the support zip file, which contains a little bit of logging uh, around what's going on behind the scenes. So the support zip is available from within your interface uh, from the support button within the x -Lake console. Start with that logging a little bit, and then, yeah, you will need to work with our support team to exactly come to uh, the conclusion of what's going on here. Awesome. Yeah, no, I think, yeah, well, well answered. Hopefully that helps uh, if that, that person has, uh, is still uh, still sticking around with us as well. Um, Okay, another another well, groovy question uh, here by the looks of things um, about some modifying some scripts. So you've modified that script and there's the snippet there, but why is it deleting the existing comment? Any sort of ad hoc help there, Majid or Usman? Yeah, maybe Ada? no. So no. So this is this is from the from a second exercise, I think, or not one of the exercises that I did. Uh, yeah, well noticed. Uh, I should have pointed this while I was presenting, but yeah, I, I didn't uh, do that. So this is because when you when, when the replica 
gets populated, it gets populated every time, right? So let's say you have a hundred comments on a ticket it, included within the replica. Then you put this filter in. And now when the next time the replica is going to be populated, it's not going to include the internal comments. And then when it goes to the destination side, it, yeah, you, you will, you, this is exactly what you will see. You will see that the internal comments are not there. There are a lot of ways around it. If you don't like this behavior, it's controllable, like via if conditions, time filters, a lot of stuff. But yeah, out of the box, this would be, this is well noticed. Awesome. Nice. Thanks for the, the in-depth answer there, answer there rather. Um, okay, another kind of user question there um, around the date created, not being synced and GitHub using the recommended default script. Uh, although received no errors, the dates are not syncing. How can we handle addressing errors such as this? Where yeah, so yep, sorry, go on. I, I already answered this in the chat. I, awesome. I think what I think what you're trying to do is populate the date created. And I know for sure Jira does not allow. I don't know about GitHub, but the Jira API itself doesn't allow you to manipulate the created date. I hope mm. I'm correct, but this is what I remember. So yeah, the answer would be that fall back to Postman, fall back to curl. But make sure that the underlying system allows it via the API, the function itself works, and then try it via Xlate. It should definitely work, yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think that's a really good point as well. Like, uh, you know, Xlate can only do what's possible in that system as well, in that environment, uh, like that super user, you know, but we can't can't break the rules there. Precisely. So all Xlate scripts are using the underlying API of the issue tracker, right? Whether it's Jira, GitHub or whatever. And from memory, what I remember is that the Jira API does not allow you to manipulate the create date. And so Xlate would not be allowed to do that uh, yeah. as well. Sure. Nice. Okay. I think I'll answer this one as well, but I just want to make sure that we got to this in enough, enough depth. Um, so do we need access to see updates from the Jira side? And the only way to, um, the only way ServiceNow can see Jira ticket is via the URL. I think I interpreted this as well. Jira users don't need access to the ServiceNow side, of course, um, and you can integrate and sync whatever data that, that is needed across. So yeah, use case for Xlate is something we call uh, license optimization, where you can take down users on one side and sync data that they would need, of course, to the other segregate your user tiers within those platforms. But I might be misinterpreting the question a little bit. Chime in if, if I have at all. I don't know if Majid or Usman, you want to chime in here either. Yeah, it's a, it's a question around decentralization, isn't it? So if one party does not have access to other party's system, what do they do? Yeah, it's a bit of a chicken and egg. Yes, you would need some level of access, even if it's read-only access, to be able to see what happened on uh, the other side. I see. Yeah, of course, of course. Yeah. Um, nice. Okay. Uh, with a long one, when doing mapping status, uh, instead of doing it in the incoming sync, can it be defined through the outgoing sync? Ah, again, a similar kind of question to the previous one about access, I believe, here. So, the use case that we're syncing with a third party that's very little Xlate knowledge. And we are having to help them with Xlate scripts all the time to handle mapping changes, et cetera, et cetera. So Majid, I think I answered it here. There is some things we can do to mitigate, but at the end of the day, it's a collaborative effort between two systems. I don't know if you've got any insights here. Yeah, I know. I, I know from this perspective, uh, the decentralized approach kind of uh, looks a bit difficult because yeah, yeah. somebody needs it on the other side. Somebody, but there's just so many... Uh, so many merits to the decentralized approach, security and autonomy being the two highlighted ones, um, mm. that you, you really, it, it is the way to go. So how people often mitigate this is to have some temporary access to the admin on the other side. That's what we've seen on, on in the field out there. Uh, what mm. we've also seen is a three-way collaboration where uh, both the admins uh, join on a video call, sometimes with us present as well, and we walk, talk through the issues. And you'd be surprised how much we are able to get done within a one hour worthy session. Yeah, of course. Uh, definitely. Um, yeah, no, well said. Um, so will the configuration generator be available in Jira Data Center too? I believe this was asked during the AI segment. Um, so yeah, Usman, correct me if I'm wrong. Of course, AI will be used across all platforms when it's all ready. Yes, it will be released onto all, all of the platforms indeed. Awesome. Nice. That's great news. And I think that is the end of the questions. Now, has there been any more before I uh, move on? Has there been any more questions while I've been chatting through that? 
Um, it's just coming up on the, my screen. I think that's um, Richard. Great question as well. I uh, see so Maggie's typing an answer. Maybe I'm beating you to it. Uh, yeah, we offer uh, different support for sure. Um, so yeah, do do reach out. It would be great. Perhaps we have a conversation. Who, what you're looking for, what you need, what stage of the journey. If you're using Excelate already, or if you're just beginning your journey with Excelate, we do offer support all, all around that. Um, so yeah, it'd be great to connect, Rich. I think you said you also may have bowled or um, played cricket at Lords. If my memory's correct from the beginning of the session, I think so. I I feel obligated to connect you directly with Magid, Magid, and we should meet at Lords Cricket Ground in London. <laughs> um, but uh, look forward course, to that. Yeah, it sounds like a fun, a fun business meeting there as well. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, of course we offer support. Uh, and so yeah, please reach out. Uh, perhaps we'll have your email from this if you don't mind. I could reach out and and we could we could have a conversation around what you're looking for. Um, okay, I think correct me if I'm wrong. Is that all the Q and A? I've got because I'm sharing my screen. It's uh, it's is is that is that everything? Um, yeah. Oh, yes. Awesome. Right. So uh, as I said, obviously Imagine's covered a lot. Um, but of course, there's there's you've just skimmed the surface really of what's possible and, and all of this. So please reach out to Majid. I think we've been putting his email in the chat as well. Um, open up a conversation. Uh, and also, if you've got any questions around the AI element of it, Ada, how it's going to look like in the in the documentation or the, the actual product itself, um, then please reach out to Usman. He's here. Connect with them on LinkedIn as well. Um, and of course, you can directly speak to Ada. This is a public documentation. Chat with her. She will get lonely otherwise. It's just me talking to her sometimes, you know, so it's it's a sad life. But, and of course, we work with a wide range of Atlassian partners, um, big and small, across the globe. Um, so if you'd like to reach out to your partner or you'd like to become a partner of Excelate uh, and, and work with your clients on implementing this, then do reach out to us too. Um, I'll drop my link in the chat. Do feel free to, to book a meeting with me, a uh, quick 15-minute call. We can go over any sort of feedback that you've got or any questions or anything like that. And I can introduce you to Majid or Usman or whoever within the business to help understand your requirements and see if Excelate is going to be a good route for you to explore. Or if you've just got any questions, if you want to chat about, chat about Tottenham or Oasis, just give me a call as well. So that being said, I think we're all good to, to wrap up there. Thank you very much all for your time. A really good to see you. And uh, we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye. Cheers, everyone. Goodbye.